episode of Surviving the Survivor, we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today uh, we've got a special treat for you, and I'm hope, hoping that STS Nation uh, gives Megan Connor, Lori Vallow's cousin, a warm welcome. I will formally introduce her in a moment. Uh, it's also your chance today to ask all the questions that you've never been able to ask before. If you put that triple Q in the chat in all caps, I'll be able to see it. Um, but first, of course, uh, to L Lori Vallow, uh, she is still awaiting trial in another case. Uh, she is separately charged in Arizona with conspiring to murder her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, with the help of her now deceased brother, Alex Cox. Of course, we had Adam and uh, Uncle Rex on not long ago. Um, Alex mysteriously died uh, three months after the children's disappearance. Some people are wondering what the heck happened there. Uh, we can ask Megan about that. Uh, Lori Vallow is also charged with conspiracy to murder her nieces, estranged husband, Brandon Boudreau, uh, that is Melanie Niece's ex-husband, after he narrowly escaped a drive-by shooting. And of course, as I said, today it is Megan Connor, uh, someone who knows Lori Vallow much differently as a family member. Megan Connor is the mother of six spectacular human beings and a breaker of generational trauma cycles. She, she survived sex trafficking as a child and spent almost 40 years in other abusive systems before finally learning how to break free. So a whole separate story within the Lori Vallow story, something we could just talk to Megan about is, you know, how she broke away from all this. Um, Megan is now an author and a coach. She teaches others how to identify and exit uh, coercive and abusive relationships and systems. She's passionate about discussing how toxic family patterns and cult mentalities led her cousin Lori Vallow Daybell to in fact become a convicted murderer and how everyone can help prevent future tragedies. Uh, that is the most important. What do we learn from all this? Uh, Megan's favorite topics to teach about healthy parenting. I could use some help with that. Family systems, high demand religion and uh, healing from trauma. Her books, I Walk Through Fire to Get Here and 100 Ways to Practice Self-Care are available on Amazon. Here's a cover to I Walk Through Fire uh, to get here. Uh, so Megan, thank you so much for being here. Um, first question, just to, uh, get the family dynamic straight. Um, how exactly are you related, uh, to Lori? Lori's my first cousin. So my dad, Cliff is Janice's brother. Your dad, Cliff. I got you. Your dad, Cliff so, Jan okay. I got you. Yeah. So Rex is my uncle and Adam's my cousin as well. Got it. And, um, so, I mean, did you, growing up, did you spend time with Lori and, and what was that all like? Yeah, during the summer, our family would come and visit the Coxes um, pretty frequently, at least once a summer for most of my childhood. And uh, they were kind of the fun house to go to. California is a fun place. They have a pool in their backyard. Um, they had nice cars and um, race horses and we were close to Disneyland. So it was always really fun to go visit them and, you know, do theme parks and fun things in California. Um, so uh, obviously this is your infamous cousin. We'll get into her in a moment, but um, I'm looking at you. And uh, if I saw you at first glance, let's say in a supermarket, I would say, wow, here's a, an attractive woman, smart, good head on her shoulders, but you've been uh, to hell and back or through the fire, uh, as you say. Yeah. How are you sitting here today um, so well put together uh, as a mother of six? H how is this how's this possible? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's really been a crazy journey. And I guess while I was going through it, I didn't really um, I, I did a lot of dissociating. So I didn't really make connections with all the terrible things that happened. I kind of minimized them and pretended like they weren't quite so bad. It wasn't until I was well into adulthood, until I was a parent myself and I was working through parenting my own children, um, that some of those memories and, um, you know, difficult struggles came back to me. 
and I had to, I had to work through them. So lots of therapy, lots of self-reflection, um, lots of, uh, removing things from my life that, that were harmful to me. So, um, you look kind of too young to have six kids. How old are these kids? <laughs> the age so, range? Yeah. So I got married when I was 20 and my oldest daughter is now 39 and I have a four-year-old grandson and, wow. um, and, and they, they run the gamut. My youngest is now 14. Wow. So how old's the oldest child? 29. 29. Okay. It's so about to turn, about to turn 30. Wow. 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 So you look, uh, Amazing. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, at a, I'm at a loss of words. Look at this. I'm not the only <laughs> one. I think you, I think people heard. I heard 39, too. Someone said. Oh, sorry. She said, she said <laughs> no. 29. Sorry, my mistake. 29. Um, <laughs> yeah, 29. Look at this. Wow. I'm not the only one in shock. Wow. She looks super young. <laughs> uh, they want to know your skincare routine right now. What is <laughs> I want to know your skincare routine. What is it? Well, I drink a lot of water. I don't wear a lot of makeup and I just always make sure to have SPF in my lotion. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Connor and Vallow family is a good looking family. Um, are you still tight with um, with Adam? We just had him, as you know, uh, him and Rex on the show. Do you stay in touch with uh, other members of the family? Um, you know, I've spoken to Rex a few times on the phone over the last couple of years Um Adam and I have texted back and forth a little bit um, since since the whole tragedy started unfolding, but we haven't, um, you know, met in person or anything. Um, I, I've tried to kind of keep in touch with with everybody that is on the healthier side of the family. So, um, you know, I I mostly keep and keep track of of Rex and his kids through Facebook. Um, we don't talk in person a lot and that's not because we don't want to, it's just really a function of uh, all of us are busy and living in different places and things like that. So. Yeah. And, and so did you grow up for, uh, did you grow up in, in Idaho or Arizona? Where did you actually grow up? So my dad was in the air force, um, when I was younger and we moved around a lot. So I was born in California, but we also lived in two places in Louisiana. We lived in South Dakota and then, um, my dad got a, job with Citibank and we moved to Connecticut, which is where I did high school and um, junior high. And then right after that, I moved to Texas and I've been here ever since. And I know you talked in your bio about uh, religion. Um, I assume um, you, you grew up in the LDS church. Is that right? And are you, yeah. are you still a member of the church? No, I left the church. Um, I officially resigned from the church uh, just a little over a year ago, but I've been um sort of what we call physically in, mentally out um, since about 2015. So it was a long, slow um, progression of me getting out. Well, um, someone in the comment section says, Megan, you look 29 yourself, followed by Ned Smith, friend of the show, just shows to go you. I think she <laughs> is playing with words here because Ned does that. Evil does not run in families. Uh, this is true. Megan is a testament that uh, you are not necessarily a reflection um of the bad in your family you can break away from it um that is for sure um what's it been like for you to now have this incredibly infamous cousin that is continuing to make headlines that had to be um really um you know uh kind of earth battering and a seismic shift to you now i want to get back to the church stuff but what's it been like um for you to now have this infamous cousin named Lori Vallow Daybell? Well, it, it was traumatic. It was really traumatic um, watching all of these events unfold. And part of the trauma of it was not really hearing firsthand from family members what was going on, but watching it unfold in the media, just like the rest of you guys. Um, I, uh, I did get notified by a family member about Charles's death and and she and I kept in touch and, um, you know, talked about things, but I was pretty disconnected from the rest of the family um, and and finding out things from strangers, you know, finding about the deaths of family members from strangers is pretty traumatic. So I was in a dark place for a long time about these things and had kind of pushed it all aside until Lori was getting ready to go to trial. And then I started re-engaging with some of the media reports just because I wanted to know what was going on. 
And I kept hearing people say <laughs> say that that Lori was such a great mother and she was so doting and she was so kind and she was so loving. And then she met Chad Daybell and all of a sudden she snapped. And that was not my experience with her at all. Um, and I wanted people to know that there was this exterior veneer that she put on that was not the real her. And the reason I think that's so important for people to understand is because we all know somebody like that. And it's so important for us to call out behaviors and hold people accountable so that they don't end up harming other people. So I know this is a tough question, but you said it's a veneer. So who is or who was uh, the real Lori Vallow at that point? I always knew her to be, well, let me just say this. As a child, she was bright, bubbly, cheerleader, sweet personality, um, really got, got along with everybody and everyone loved her. Um, when I was about 18 years old, I moved in with um, Lori and Adam in their apartment in Austin, Texas, and lived with them for a few months. And it was then that I really saw the, the manipulative side of Lori. And I learned very quickly that if you crossed her or if you made her angry, she could be really vicious. And she was vicious um, to me on a number of occasions. But the way our family operates, we don't really have discussions about difficult things. And so, you know, something bad would happen. And then the next time we saw each other, it was as if it never happened. You know, we just pretended everything was fine just for the sake of getting along. Um, and it's interesting you say that's, you know, that that exists in a lot of families. And I think that's true. There are people, um, that kind of put on, um, sort of like a, a, a false veneer about, you know, things being wonderful. And a lot of times in families, I think that is the case. It's coming from the son of a psychiatrist and social worker. We, we over communicated in my family, which can be another issue because I right. still wind to my mom, but um, not communicating at all, I think is a, a real problem. I do want to open this up and we'll, we'll have a, I was telling Megan, we're, uh, we're low key. We're, we're sort of relaxed. I'm not, but we're sort of relaxed as a STS nation family. So, uh, Morgan here, uh, she obviously heard you on some different shows. I loved your Lori Callie bathroom story. Did you ever think it was odd that Barry bought Lori's breast implants? I don't know anything about this story. What is this story? Megan? Um, well, I don't know how uh, PG your audience is, so I don't know if the story is appropriate or not. But <laughs> you, you can go for it. You can you can you can talk freely here. We're one big happy family. It's between us. <laughs> yeah. So you know, just just a little bit of a trigger warning if anybody has um, you know difficulty with language or anything like that. But uh, so when I was about thirteen and I was visiting the Coxes, um, Janice and Barry were in Las Vegas, and it was just the kids' home. And so Lori Summer and I um, spent some time going to theme parks and water parks and, and stuff like that. And getting ready in the Cox household was a big deal for the girls. They spent a lot of time doing hair and makeup and all that kind of stuff. And the three of us were in the bathroom getting ready to, uh, I think we were going to a water park that day. And I put on my bathing suit and realized for like the first time, cause they called it out to me that my pubic hair was showing you know, cause I didn't, I was a 13 year old kid. I hadn't thought about that before. And Lori was like, your pubes are showing. That's so gross. You need to shave. And I was like, okay, I didn't really, you know, <laughs> never heard people talk like that before. I was like, all right. So, um, you know, they, she, she handed me a razor and said, you know, you can just go in the shower and shave in there. And she goes, just don't shave it all off or nobody will want to fuck you. And I was like, um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. And it was like so weird for, you know, LDS kids who are told that sex is the sin next to murder and you don't have sex until you're married. And it's just like such a taboo thing that I was like, how do you, how do you even know that? You know, how do you know about hair and having sex? Like I just didn't, I didn't have any idea where that came from. So it was obvious to me looking back on it now that they had lots of open conversations about sex in the Cox household. And, and I don't know. I mean, that that's a story I would not expect to hear. But uh, then again, I don't think any, you know, ev everything is kind of on the table with you just don't know what's going on. But what do you think? Like, I don't want to say ulterior motive, but what do you think was was she trying to 
shock you? What do you think she was getting at by telling you this? Was she trying to, um, you know, be a, a big cousin to you? I, 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 what, what do you think the dynamic was and, and the purpose of telling you all that was? Well, it was pretty clear to me, even as a 13 year old, that like Lori was in charge. So whatever she wanted to do, we did. And however she wanted me to dress, I dressed. Um, I came home from that trip with a picture of myself dressed up to go to a dance. And I don't even look like myself. I look like a, a, a Madonna clone, um, you know, hair teased up to here and a mini skirt and a mesh shirt and stuff I never would have worn or put on at my house. But Lori wanted that's what Lori wanted me to wear. So that's what I did, you know. Um, it was, it was, it was easier for me to let her be in charge and boss me around than it was to push back. And so I just did that. And for the record, to answer the second part of that question, of course, I thought it was weird that Barry bought Lori's breast implants. Like no father should be buying <laughs> breast implants for their child. Um, he was, he, he made a comment to us at one point that, you know, some, some people get well endowed and unfortunately Lori was just born with a couple of fried eggs. So we're going to help her take care of that. Wow. Uh, and you were there when he said that? Yeah. Wow. That's uh, disturbing to say the least, especially yeah. as a dad to two young girls and a son. Uh, Tennis Girl 101, uh, you kind of just touched on it here, but what is Megan's opinion of Lori's dad? And thank you, Megan, for talking to us. Um, I generally try to give people the benefit of the doubt and I try to be um I try to be generous when I speak about other people but I'm I I'm not able to do that speaking about Barry. So I don't really I I don't have anything kind to say about him. There you go. Um that's the answer. So just back to the LDS church because I think this is important. Um this is obviously a very touchy su subject. You know, it's a religion. A lot of people are obviously in the church, um, but it gets a fair amount of uh, criticism because of stories like this and others. I think all religions do. But what is your perspective on the religion from um, what Lori does not know boundaries, obviously, Ned Smith says here. But what is your perspective as an former insider of the LDS church now that you're on the outside and, and what made your decision to finally kind of excommunicate yourself from the church or divorce yourself from the church? Yeah. So, you know, when you're raised in a high demand religion, it's sort of is like indoctrination, you know, and I'm a seventh generation Mormon, my whole family, um, you know, every aunt, uncle, cousin, everybody is a member of the church. So it wasn't something as a child that I ever questioned that um, whether or not it was right or true, because everybody around me was telling me that it was true. And everybody around me was telling me that not only was it true, but it's the only true church on the face of the earth, the only church with all of the knowledge. And so, you know, when you're in that position for your growing up years and, and your life and everyone's telling you that, it's it's really hard to question it. Um, but I did start to question it. And I did have a lot of issues with the culture of, you know, patriarchy, women not in leadership positions, the purity culture, the um, kind of slut shaming culture, um, and the demand that that you be perfect, basically. And it just was it got harder and harder for me to, um, to accept the cultural things that that were wrong and bad and hard about the church. And I, I will just say that anytime that you are in a culture, a system, uh, a, whether it's a church, a belief system, a family, whatever, where normal, healthy sexual expression is repressed and shamed, it's going to come out in abusive ways. And I think that's one of the main reasons that the LDS church has such a problem with sex abuse. And we've heard a lot of these stories now coming out that have been kept secret for a long time, um, lots of cases of abuse. And I think that's directly related to the culture of secrecy and shame within the church. So I started to really make my exit after November 2015. The church issued a policy that said that the children of gay couples could not get baptized unless they denounced their parents' relationship, basically. And, you know, having two LGBTQ sons myself 
and um, being a closeted bisexual woman at that time, um, that was super harmful to me. So it's that's what started my exit from the church was that. And then um, I kind of got to this place where I was like, well, I guess it's true and I just don't fit. And, you know, I'm never going to get to the highest level of Mormon heaven. So I stopped going, going to church um, during the pandemic and just never went back. It wasn't until um, I was finishing my book, actually, around December of 2022, that I allowed myself to finally examine the truth claims of the church and um, try to find out if it was really true or not. And in examining the way that the church was founded, in the way that Joseph Smith operated, in the way that he presented all of the things that he did, um, I did a lot of research and reading of source documents and journals and um, reading of articles, newspaper articles that were written at the time about the church and came to the absolute conclusion that it, it could not be true. The truth, the truth claims could not be true. And so I officially resigned last year. For, forgive my ignorance, but what, when you say a high demand religion, what does that mean? Um, any religion that dictates your behavior to the degree that that this church does. Um, they tell you who you can and can't marry. They tell you who, where you should go to school, what kind of professions are acceptable, um, what you're allowed to read and watch and, and consume media-wise. They control the information that you're receiving. They control your thoughts by telling you things like, oh, if you leave, where are you gonna go? Nothing else is true, you know, and telling you to doubt your doubts and telling you not to talk to people who are not members of the church about the church and not to read things that aren't written by the church. So it's just a very all encompassing controls your whole life kind of thing. You, I when I was a faithful, believing Mormon, I didn't have time for anything outside of Mormonism because I, you know, all the members are the ones running the church. Right. So I had teaching callings and music callings and activities. And it's it's an all day, every day thing. So uh, Megan's own story is incredible. So we'll kind of bounce back and forth a little bit between Lori and Megan. But I'm curious, uh, do you do you believe it's a big question and you can tell me to buzz right off. But do you believe in God still? Um, I don't. I I deconstructed every single strand of everything that I believed um, from the very beginning to the very end. And I ultimately came to the conclusion that I think God is a construct that we as human beings came up with as a way of managing our existential fear of um, of meaninglessness and fear of death. And I think that every religion that's ever existed is is that. Uh, I'm fascinated by this because I, I think about this. I'm in my own conundrum about that. So just to share a personal story, you know, my dad passed away very sadly. I was very close with him. He was almost 90 years old. But mm. in the Jewish faith, you have to say, you know, you're supposed to don't have to. But I did. You're supposed to say a prayer called the Kaddish for 11 months every day. Religious Jews say it three times a day. But I did it because uh, it was a connection to my father. But the whole time mm. I was in there. Um, you know, I was asking myself, does this guy really exist up there? You know, like, and it's, it's, these are very hard questions. And I tell religious Jews who I meet, yeah, I wish I believed like you, because it, it brings you such a comfort, you know, when you're really a true believer. Um, and I, I, I have a very hard time getting my, you know, this is just me going off the rails here about that. But what I'm curious about is how you, I'm a manic -y guy. Like I'm always like doing stuff, you know, I'm, I'm sending you a text. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I, I never give myself proper time to sit down. And like you said, you deconstructed it all. So I'm curious about your process. How did you come to these conclusions? Like, did you stay up at night and say, Hey, this is what happened when I was younger. This is what I'm doing now. Was it a process over time? Like, did you give yourself space each day to work on this? How did you come to all these conclusions? It definitely was a process. Um, like I said, I started uh, looking, examining truth claims in December, and I would really just like, I would look at one thing. And honestly, if, if there's anybody out there who's LDS um, or who was in the LDS church, 
Um, this might, I don't know if it'll help your process, but I, help, I hope it does. I, I was a gospel doctrine teacher, so I taught out of all of the Mormon scriptures, and I knew the doctrine backwards and forwards 100%. Um, my set of scriptures was marked in, you know, in technicolor, almost every verse of, it, of, of every book. So um, the first thing that that sort of has always been this question um, in my mind, and actually polygamy was the was the first big thing. But but after that, you know, during the pandemic and the George Floyd incident, I started examining my own potential racism and the racism in the church. And I was like, confused because I, I remember that Joseph Smith ordained a black man to the priesthood back in the very beginning of the church. And so I was like, okay, well then why did we stop ordaining black men? And was that, you know, was that Brigham Young or was that, you know, Joseph Smith or who said that and how did it start? So I just looked at that one thing and I pondered about what I found out about that one thing for like a month and a half. <laughs> trying to work that out in my mind of like, how did this come to pass? And um, when I sort of felt like I was good with, with my answer on that one, I started looking at um, another problem. And I came across this article. It was a scholarly article that was written by Shannon Caldwell Montez, and it's called The Secret Mormon Meetings of 1922. And this was her master's thesis in history. And she told um, the story basically of how a church historian named B.H. Roberts, who was a faithful member of the church, um, he started thinking about problems in the Book of Mormon and in, in anachronisms such as like, why were there horses and steel in, you know, 600 BC America? And he wrote a paper that was around 200 pages long of all the problems that he found with the Book of Mormon. And he went and presented it to the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in Salt Lake. And they basically dismissed him and then sent him on a mission, which in the church, that was kind of the old way of getting somebody out of the public eye so that they couldn't say bad things about the church. And after I read that, um, I was convinced that the leadership of the church has known that the truth claims are are not true for a very long time, or at least that they must suspect all of these problems, but they don't want the information to get out there because it would it would lots of people would leave the church, right? Once I read that article, I went down a rabbit hole for about three days, and I spent three days reading and crying and reading and crying. And just that was the beginning of my deconstruction. And um, when I surfaced from that and made the decision to um, to hit send on that paper that removes your name from the records of the church, I felt so peaceful and I literally felt shame leave my body. I was like, I don't have to be ashamed of who I am anymore or try to fit myself into a box I don't fit into because it's almost impossible for someone to live up the expectations of the Mormon church unless you're a white, hetero, cisgendered male. So, um, but the but the process has been ongoing and I just keep reading and crying, reading, crying and journaling, you know, and I definitely went through a real dark period of um, nihilism where I just felt like nothing mattered and why am I even here and who even am I? You know, and I had to I, I had to do a lot of work to process through that. But I think it went quickly for me because I had already left my family system. I'd left my marriage. I'd left my career. I had removed all these other unhealthy things from my life already. So I knew how to do it. I knew how to deconstruct and reconstruct and and bounce back quickly. So for somebody who um, a little just a little over a year ago, absolutely believed in God to to now absolutely not believing in God, but believing in spirituality, believing in connection, um, believing that we're all made of the same stardust and we're all connected as a human family. Um, that for that to take only a year, I think is is probably fast for most people. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Uh, that's heavy and deep stuff right there. Um, yeah. Do you feel badly uh, when you when you see um, young women or men who are in the church now? Do you feel badly for them? 
I I do. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it because there's a big part of me that just wants to burn it all to the ground, you know, because they cause so much harm and not wanting other people to go through the harm that I went through and that others have been through and seeing the the harm and the abuse that the church does is really, really hard for me. But the other side of it that I see is, you know, there are people like my parents who are in their 70s. I think that it would absolutely shatter their whole world if they found out that the church wasn't true. So I don't ever want to convince anybody to leave the church because it's so incredibly difficult to have your entire worldview crash down around you. And I would I don't want anybody to go through that either. So I, I'm really mainly just an advocate of, of telling the truth. I think people should have informed consent. I think that members of the church should know the truth of what's out there. I think that they they should do their research. And then if they decide to stay, of course, that's their decision. But I think it's wrong to keep the truth from them, to keep them in the church. And I assume your parents who are in their 70s know. What was their reaction to all of this? Um, to me leaving the church? Yeah, yes. <laughs> well, you know, I... Um, my my parents sometimes like to do this thing where they where they will say, well, we're we're praying for you and we we're really just hoping that you're going to do X, Y, Z in your life and whatever. And I didn't really want to hear that from them when I left the church. So I just wrote a letter giving my reasons and just saying, you know, if you're if you're interested in having a conversation with me about it, I, I would be open to that. But I really don't want to be told that, you know, that I should come back to church, basically. And, you know, they they were pretty receptive to it, except for the fact that, you know, my my dad basically thinks I I think my dad believes that I um, am that I just made a mistake and that I'm just having a bad moment in my life and that I'll come back eventually. He's like, I know that it's true and I know that, you know, that it's true. Um, so, you know, they're just in that spot, I think, where they're always going to hope that I come back. But th I'm very clear with them that I'm not so. And, you know, good for you. I mean, it takes a lot of courage. Is it weird to talk about this out loud? It is a little bit. Yeah, because it's so personal and recent. Um, and although I, I have obviously done some interviews um, about it, it's um, it's always a little strange for me to to be so vulnerable with strangers. But I, I think it's just so important. And that's the reason I keep talking about it. I think it's important for people to hear the truth. And I also think it's important for people to have examples of someone who was able to, to escape essentially, and, and actually have a happy life. Because what they tell you in the church is that if you leave the church, you're going to be miserable. You're going to lose that light in your eyes. You're going to lose that shine in your countenance. And your whole life is going to be ruined if you leave the church. And I, I've found exactly the opposite. You know, I think it's such a difficult, um, obviously, just one of the most difficult topics because, you know, believers believe. And if you don't believe, you're not a believer. And uh, it's it's like talking politics in, in, in 2024. It's like mm -hmm. everyone's got a side. It's so tribal that if you try to, you know, um, present your point of view and it's not the other person's point of view, there's immediately going to be some kind of conflict. So uh, sure. to go out there and talk about it is, uh, is impressive. It's, it's tough to, I'm sure it's tough to discuss, but um, love my Selby blue has had this comment up for a while. Do you think Lori will go back and forth? Cause I, I, I like Megan's story more than Lori's. I'm tired of Lori. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you think Lori ever was a victim of sexual assault? Just wondering with her reported behavior with Alex and men in general, have you ever pondered this? Yeah, of course I've pondered it. Um, and, and of course we can only speculate, right? We're never gonna know the real answer to that question, but I can say as a sexual assault survivor myself, um, who was abused as a young child and then um, had a couple of other incidences in my adulthood, I can definitely say that there are some behaviors and thought patterns that exist in Lori that I definitely had myself. Um, when I was, before I w went through my healing process. And so it would make sense to me if she had been sexually assaulted. Mm. Um, from Boston, Sarah, Megan, thank you for sharing your story. Do you think Chad led Lori down the path of destruction? It sounds like she was a little out there early on with that story you told us, or do you think Lori sort of led the two down such a destructive path? Was it Chad or Lori or Lori and Chad or both? What do you think? 
this is the age old question. I think that everybody asks, right? Chicken, um, chicken or the egg? Chicken or the egg? Yeah, I, I think if you look at both lives of each individual person, Chad and Lori, you can see that there were signs in their lives prior to their meeting that were going to lead them down this path or somewhere close. And so I think when they got together, it was a perfect storm situation. Um, obviously, Lori had manipulative behaviors prior to this. She obviously, she spoke a lot about the end times. She was super interested in near-death experiences. Um, she was always talking about how great it would be to raise our kids in the millennium after Jesus comes instead of having to raise them now where the world is so chaotic. So she definitely had these ideas, right? And then Chad, you have Chad writing about near-death experiences, which I think is what attracted Lori to him in the first place. But Chad was also telling people privately that his wife was going to die young. And so it's almost like he sort of set that up to happen. And, um, you know, I, I think Chad telling Lori that she was a goddess in a previous life and that she was, um, that they had been married in a previous life and that she was going to be instrumental in gathering the 144,000. Those were things that Lori wanted and needed to hear because she wanted to feel important and special. If we can talk a little psychology, right? It's like, when a when a young girl is not doesn't have a close um, secure attachment with their father, they're going to look for attention outside externally, right? And they're not going to be able to to have us have a sense of self worth that allows them to believe positive things about them, and so they look for other people to tell them positive things about themselves. And so when Chad did that for her, it was like magic. And, you know, they were bonded from that time forward. And I think after that, it was just a matter of, um, you know, Lori, be, the, I think the prosecution nailed it when they said it was about power, sex and money. That's all she wanted. And, and anybody who got in her way was eliminated or discarded. Do you think she's crazy? People think it was mental illness. Do you think that's it? Well, there's always got to be some kind of mental illness if if you're willing to kill somebody and especially your own children, even if you're not the one who pulls the trigger. You know, it's it, it's by definition, it's mentally ill. Right. Um, but, you know, we can we can all speculate about what kind of mental illness there is. The, the point is, I think that Lori had a lot of unmet emotional needs. And she went about meeting those needs in unhealthy ways. And most people in that circumstance don't get as extreme as Lori did. But I think she really did convince herself that Charles and her children and Tammy were dead and that there were zombies in, uh, you know, or dark spirits. There's a book that she loved called Visions of Glory, and it was under her knee when she was served poolside with the order to produce her children. She carried that book around with her. She marked it up like a Bible. She quoted from it. That was that was basically their doctrine. And in that book, it talks specifically about the fact that if you commit any kind of sin, whether you're drinking or partying or looking at porn, that it creates a rip in your soul and that an evil spirit can enter your body at that time. So that was Lori's favorite book. And so she really did believe, I think, that her kids and Charles and Tammy had sinned and that there were dark spirits inhabiting them. And so I think she believed that when the children were killed, I think she believed her kids were already dead, but that the, that the dark spirits were there. So, Wow, that is eerie. Um, from LME Toots. Hi, Joel. Uh, Megan from the UK. Does Megan think there was incest in the family? This is so disturbing about the breast implants. Lori, uh, Chad seemed like a classic folia do, but still not sure who led who. And then followed by this comment. Do you think Lori and Alex had an uh, inappropriate relationship? Uh, what about their dynamic? It is bizarre at the very least, incredibly unhealthy. And, um, you know, maybe more than that at the worst. But what do you make of it? Yeah, this is one of those things, Other, another one of those things people love to speculate about. I, I don't have any idea if, if it was true incest, but 
it's not normal for brothers and sisters to grab each other's body parts. It's not normal for brothers and sisters to simulate sex with each other. It's not normal or healthy for them to talk about sex and sexuality in the way that they did, even as kids. And, you know, it, it always made me super uncomfortable how touchy feely everybody in the family was with each other. And I never, I never thought that was a good dynamic, but now as a fully healed adult, looking back at it, you know, it's, that should have been a red flag for anybody who had any interaction with that part of the family. Um, and I, I think what is disturbing to me is to hear family members now say like, I don't think there was anything weird going on between them, but there was something weird going on between them. It doesn't matter if they were having sex or not. It's not normal to behave that way with a sibling. A hundred percent not. Um, did you go to therapy to deal with this? It sounds like you did a lot of this work on your own, but did you actually go and speak to someone? Oh yeah. I did tons yeah. and tons of therapy. I was actually in a, I was in an intensive outpatient program for about six weeks over the summer where it was nine hours of therapy a week. And that was, that was pretty intense because it was like doing all the therapy took a lot of time and then putting myself back together after the therapy sessions took the rest of my time. So that was all I did for six weeks was try to heal. What about your, uh, your immediate family? Your, you have the six kids. I think you mentioned, um, the two of them are, are gay. Um, how they reacted to all this. Um, I didn't specifically say they were gay. I just want to point out um, they are LGBTQ. Okay. Um, my, you know, I, I try to really shield my kids from it for, for the most part, especially my younger kids. I didn't talk to them about what was going on. My older kids, of course, knew what was going on. My oldest daughter lived in Rexburg in 2019. And I remember calling her and, you know, after Charles was killed and hearing the stories from a couple of family members about the cult mentality that was happening. I called my daughter and I was like, please don't pick up the phone. If they call you, if, if you see them in public, please don't talk to them. Please stay away from these people. This is really dangerous and I'm really worried and scared for you. So. Um, we're looking at JJ and uh, Ty, Ty Lee up here um, from Yogi Bagel. Do you think Lori manipulated Ty Lee? Do you think Ty Lee was actually hurt by Lori's ex? Um, your thoughts. Did, did you ever meet JJ or Ty Lee? I met Ty Lee. I knew her. And I think the last time I saw her, she was around three years old or so, maybe a little older than that. Um, saw her infrequently at family gatherings and things like that. I never did meet JJ. Sorry, just looking at their faces is always hard for me. Yeah, um, I forgot the question. Oh, do you think Lori manipulated Ty Lee? I mean, she would have had to, right? Ty Lee is incredibly smart. And um, I think she knew what was going on. I think she knew a lot more than she was willing to let on. There was a really telling, um, touching and sad and scary thing that I saw on when Lori went in to talk with the police about Charles stealing her purse. And it was Lori and Ty Lee. And I think Melanie Gibb were in that interview. You can see at one point that Lori's getting agitated and Ty Lee just reaches over and touches her mom's arm. And then Lori says, I'm sorry, I just get really upset and agitated about this kind of stuff. So you can see Tylee reaching over there to calm her, to comfort her. It's it's touching to see that, but it's also sad because right here you have a 16-year-old girl who feels like it's her responsibility to manage her mother's emotions. And so, you know, Lori's, uh, the effect of a mother like Lori on a child is so damaging because she, Lori made her life all about herself and her kids were just like a, an item to be shown. And, um, I did witness Lori body shaming Tylee and, um, you know, treating her terribly. So I just, I, my heart aches for her, for, for the life that she had and for the fact that, uh, that it was cut short just because of selfishness. Um, I know how difficult this is, so I appreciate you being here uh, and talking openly about it. Um, Lisa S. says, uh, Megan is an incredible, high-minded thinker, and I love listening to her. I feel like I'm learning, not just uh, leering at a tragedy, uh, which is good. We don't want um, 
rubberneckers at a tragedy. Um, <laughs> Anna Marie M. I could listen to Megan all day. I could too. This is she's one of the most compelling guests I think we've ever had. By the way, when everyone's saying how young and good looking you are, Megan, Blackwood Door, who's in the Republic of Ireland, says that I look great compared to Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, <laughs> who's been a heroin addict or a recovering heroin addict and is 100 years old. But uh, thank you. I agree. This uh, conversation, uh, all because of Megan, not because of me, is really uh, amazingly interesting. Um, I, I know this part is tough, but I, you had to think, you know, how, the, the crimes are horrific towards um, JJ and Ty Lee. Do you think it was Alex who physically carried this out? I, uh, you know, speculation always. Um, I, what I think probably happened most likely is that they were poisoned probably by Lori and that Alex was the one who, um, who actually killed them. Um, I, it's, and maybe it's just selfish me giving myself, trying to give myself some comfort that they, that they didn't suffer as much um, being poisoned, just, you know, given Lori's habit of, um, of poisoning people, let's just be real. If you look at, you know, if you look at her history and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Alex was the one who actually um, killed them. Um, this is a uh, off the beaten path, but sort of uh, just because Ruby Frankie was part of the LDS church. I don't know if you followed this story at all, but obviously mm -hmm. she was um, giving parenting advice with millions of followers and it was abusing her children. Um, did that give you reason for pause when that story broke? Were you like, here we go again? Yeah, I, you know, I've been following all of these Mormon crimes over the last couple of years. It seems like it's been um, there's been an uptick in in Mormons committing crimes. Um, I don't I want to say, first of all, like these are not problems that are unique to the Mormon church. Um, these people are not unique to the Mormon church. But I think there is an aspect of Mormonism that brings these harmful things out in people. And part of it is what I've talked about is the shame and the secrecy. Yes, I follow, followed the Ruby Frankie, um, Jody Hildebrandt story and continue to follow it because I want to know um, what, you know, I, I, I like to see child abusers being held accountable. And so um, I, I saw a few clips of Ruby Frankie's uh, YouTube channel that she had, and it just screams to me of harmful parenting practices of, you know, shaming your kids, withholding food from your kids, withholding comfort from your kids, not letting them sleep in their beds when they're punished. You know, those those kinds of things are incredibly harmful. And I think that this sort of rigid black and white thinking is enhanced by the, the culture of the church and the and the mindset of the church. It's almost like uh, there are a lot of families that become a microcosm of the Mormon church with the father as a strong patriarch and with the mother doing the best that she can to keep her children contained in the Mormon box. And these controlling behaviors, I, I think, are unconscious for a lot of people. I think they were for my parents. But if you if you want to look perfect, you want your family to look perfect, there's pretty much only one way to do it because people aren't perfect and they're, they are going to make mistakes. You have to make room for them to be individuals and not try to fit them into this cookie cutter ideal because that doesn't exist. Um, from M. Morgan, uh, you are such a truth seeker. I wonder if that made you the scapegoat in your family of origin. Do you feel like you're a scapegoat? I mean, it sounds like your parents, it sounds like your dad at least just feels like you're going through a, a stage, even though you're obviously close to 50 years old, but uh, <laughs> we still go through stages. But um, ha did you become the scapegoat of the family? Um, I, I have on some levels. I also don't know all the conversations that my family has about me behind my back, and I really don't care. Um, you know, they're, they're people that I care about, um, but they, at the end of the day, I think there's a version of me that exists for them that, that is not real. Um, my sister and I are still close. My younger brother and I are relatively close and I don't talk with my older brother and I just have limited contact with my parents because being in touch with them is not healthy for me. 
So if I am the scapegoat, that's fine. Um, I think definitely uh, the Cox part of the family, um, maybe with the exception of Adam, I don't know exactly how he feels about me, but I know he hasn't listened to my interviews. So, you know, I, well, that kind of tells fairness, you. He says he hasn't listened to anything in fairness. To yeah. Him. Yeah. And that's <laughs> totally, yeah. And that's totally fine. But also, I, I also though think, I think that a lot of that is probably because he knows that I'm out of the church. He knows that I'm critical of the church and it's really hard when you're in the church to hear people that you love and respect speak critically of the church because it makes you question your own beliefs. Um, it's like, here's this person who I love and I know they're a smart person and they left the church and that's hard for me because I'm still in it. So I totally understand, um, you know, family members not wanting to talk to me. I get that. Um, as far as uh, Janice and Barry and Summer are concerned, I'm sure that they're angry about some of the things that I'm saying. I'm sure that they probably have anger and animosity towards me. It's always really hard for someone to point out your flaws. And that goes for me too. When someone points out my flaws, it always, you know, it stings a little bit, right? But if we are introspective enough to care about being healthy and to care about not causing harm to other people, then, then we're going to take that honest criticism as an opportunity to improve and to do something different. And um, you know, Janice and Barry have participated in the harm of children, and therefore they're not welcome in my life. Mm. Uh, one of my dad's favorite sayings was, mind your business. I'm going to write my next book about him. Um, and it sounds like you're minding your business when it comes to what your family thinks of you. Made me think, um, do, do you do you believe Lori, um, for all her craziness, whether she's both evil and mentally ill or just evil or just whatever the combination of things are that caused her to do what she did. Uh, she's where she belongs now. But do you, do you think she's a narcissist? Do you think she likes the attention? Do you think she liked being in court? Um, we always saw her smiling at really inappropriate moments. Um, what about the attention factor for her? Yeah, I think it's very obvious that she loves the attention. I think this is the Lori show to her. I think she believes that she's like the center of the universe and that's why you see her smiling and flipping her hair in court and, you know, why you see her flirting with the guards who are transporting her and things like that. She she loves the attention. Do you think she's seeking like while she's in prison, do you think she's seeking out attention, trying to read articles about herself? Do you think that's that's her nature? Yeah, I'm sure she is. I'm sure she wants to know what's being said about her in the press and things. And I'm sure she's got her own little cult in prison. It's hard to imagine that she would just be solitary. She, I'm sure she's trying to, to co-opt people and things like that. And and I just want to point out, too, there's nothing wrong with attention seeking behavior in in a mod in moderation. Right. All of us like to have attention on some level. I think it turns toxic when we are seeking attention and validation externally because we don't love and accept ourselves internally. And I think that is apparent with Lori as well. And I think that's an amazing point. Uh, you've got to validate yourself from within side. You will never be validated uh, externally. So I think that is super important. I want my kids to learn that lesson. Um, there's a question up here. Uh, Megan, did you ever come out to your family about your sexuality earlier? You said you were bisexual for a period of time. If they did, how'd they handle it? Uh, thanks for sharing tonight. Um, I think you said you also left your husband. I, I assume because he was probably an LDS church member, among other things. But um, how long ago was that that you and your husband split up? Um, we separated in 2017. So we've been divorced quite a while. Um, to answer well to clarify one thing i wasn't bisexual for a period of time i am bisexual <laughs> okay, okay. um and i <laughs> i i did come out uh to the family members who i knew would treat that very personal information with care so i didn't you know make a big announcement to my whole family but i did tell the people that were important to me of course i told my kids um, I really don't think that it's anybody's business what your sexuality is, but I I don't mind telling people because, again, I I want there to be able to be a healthy and open conversation about sex and sexuality instead of it being a polarizing and shaming conversation. Um, are there therapists? And there's a question earlier that I'll wrap into this, but 
from Katie H. Are there therapists who specialize in treating former LDS members? Uh, the other question was, do you feel like therapists are trained well enough to deal? And I am not saying LDS is a cult, but this was a question in cults and I guess high demand religions, uh, as the term is known. Yeah, I think it's very important if you are exiting any kind of a faith system to make sure that the professional that you're working with is specifically trained to do that. And there are courses that therapists can take as continuing education to understand Mormonism and to understand uh, the Mormon church and how to help someone exit that. So yes, there are therapists that special in that specialize in that. There are coaches that specialize in that. That's one of the things that I do in my coaching as well. Um, when you are selecting a therapist, you're hiring them for the job of protecting and enhancing your metal, mental health. So it should absolutely be a job interview. And I actually have a guide on my website that's a free guide people can download about how to hire a therapist. I think it's really important to have a lot of open discussion with a person before you hire them and to ask them the right questions. Have they done their own work? What kind of therapy work have they done? How extensive was it? Um, you know, and, and those kind of things. And you want to make sure that they're specializing in the area that, that you're looking specifically for. If you've been in a high demand religion or a high demand family system, you need somebody who specializes in trauma because those, those situations are traumatic. By the way, do you have a podcast? You need to have a podcast, Megan. You better get on that. Do it, you have it's, one? It's in the works, actually. I um I just uh, started started working on it, so I've got two or three episodes, sort of in different stages of production. And I I'm my goal is to launch on April Fool's Day, but I don't know if that's going to happen or not. It's I've got a lot of steps between here and there. Uh, I'm not really good at it, but if you need advice, the COE will uh, will give you plenty of, of advice. We've learned a lot. Um, this has been a crazy journey, um, so we've learned a lot. If you need any help, we are happy to help. And I know that STS Nation, um, they will definitely support the podcast, but you are, you are right for a podcast, and um, I think it would do amazingly well. Um, so I think you should definitely get in, you know, I'm glad to hear that you are in the in the steps of producing one. So that is yeah. great. Um, I'd love to have your help. Yes. Yeah. We'll 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 connect. Out. Obviously, I have your number. We'll connect after the show. Um, what about the trial itself? Were you able to bring yourself to watching a trial? I know when I talked to Adam, which is why I don't think it's necessarily personal to you. He he just seemed like he was too busy he made it seem but maybe it was there are other reasons at play where it's obviously so hard for family members um to watch this but were you able to watch the trial yeah i did watch everything that was um broadcast the the transcripts and everything i listened to, i listened to all the testimony I, with the exception of maybe one or two small things when i had to take a mental health break um but i can imagine for adam that must have been uh, heart wrenching. I I totally understand why he wouldn't want to watch it. Um, I I give a lot of props to Rex for showing up in person and being there. I did not feel the need to be there in person. I didn't really want to sit in the same room with Lori, and that wasn't an avoidance issue. It was just a protection of my mental health, and I wanted to understand, uh, fill in the gaps of all my understanding about what ha happened and how this happened. But it was really difficult and it it did kind of consume my time and energy for, you know, for the length of the time that the trial was going on. So it was hard and it was hard for the people around me to to see me kind of dive back in to this unhealthy system that I that I left behind a long time ago. So it was it was really difficult. Uh, just a very quick programming note tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We're staying. I, I know it's posted differently, but we're staying on the Madeline Soto case. We've got. Detective Phil Ramos, veteran homicide detective out of Vegas, and uh, Detective Sergeant Chris Anderson, and the other veteran homicide detective from the show, First 48. They're going to be here at 5 p.m. We'll get a different set of uh, eyeballs, uh, as well as a person that deals in psychology from the John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice. Uh, as you see here, um, let me just throw this question out. Philadelphia shoulder surgeon, in light of all that's happened, Megan, what are your thoughts on the claims against uh, Joe Ryan or about Joe Ryan and then the ultimate death? Yeah, so when Lori um, 
told us that she was divorcing Joe and accused him of sexually assaulting the children, that was kind of the time when I started pulling back from the family and disengaging until, um, you know, uh, just until Janice and Barry lived in San Antonio. And it was, that was really hard for me because I, I mean, I'd met Joe only one time, didn't really know him that well, but the way in which Lori was making these accusations felt off to me. It felt wrong. And I didn't know who was telling the truth and who wasn't. And I also hadn't dealt with my own sexual abuse at that time. So I wasn't really capable of engaging in that conversation. But if you go back and you look at the divorce documents, which are publicly available as FOIA documents, um, you can see that the custody evaluators in the case. Um, their final report indicated that they did not believe that Joe sexually assaulted or sexually abused the children. I have to be really careful about saying that because I think there was some abuse going on. Um, I don't know specifically what kind or who was doing it, but I can definitely say this was another one of those situations that seemed like Lori discarding someone who was no longer useful to her. And that was a pattern. It became a pattern in her life. And so um, as far as his death goes, I it, it's absolutely 100% on brand for that to have been, for Lori to have been involved in that. It happened in 2018. Um, it's definitely possible that he was poisoned somehow. Um, you know, Lori had access to his apartment because Tylee had the keys for her um, visitation. So, I, I mean, we all can, this is all speculation, right? But in light of everything that's happened, what makes the most sense? Does it make the most sense that he died of natural causes and wasn't found and, you know, and nobody knew what happened? Or does it make more sense in light of everything that we know that Lori was responsible for his death and wanted to be able to collect the, you know, for Tylee to collect the um, the social security payments on that? What makes more sense in light of everything we know? Uh, there, where there is smoke, there's general, generally fire. There's so many coincidences. So you got to wonder um, if some of these were, um, you know, pre premeditated uh killings here uh the coe with this graphic if you love the show write a review don't forget to give us five stars but uh it helps us so much don't be a one star person people annoy the crap out of me i always get these one stars <laughs> uh just because they're spiteful uh, especially clown if they don't leave a comment you know yeah exactly at least leave the comment um right. besides Lori's murdered husband this is from clown world and that's a creepy ass photo right there was there anyone who reported Lori and chad's troubling philosophy and actions uh does anyone in your family feel some sort of sense of um responsibility and or guilt because of this i personally i can only speak for myself i have had these guilty feelings and have had so much grief to process over this like for the whole time that this has happened you know i withdrew myself for the from the family for my own mental health and so that i could become a, a more healed human being for my children but when i did that i also um lost the ability to be an influence in Lori's life for good. And I wrestle with that. I wrestle with the fact that if I had stayed connected to her, I, I maybe could have helped things come out differently. I, I give myself a lot of grace though, because that's assuming a lot, right? It's assuming that anything that I said would have made a dent in her mentally ill brain. Um, but I do wrestle with that grief. And I think that's one of the hardest things about this situation is that serial killers and murderers kill their families too. Like the family is also a victim of this person and nobody in the family is ever going to be the same after this. And we all have to examine our own potential role and, and our potential harmful behavior in this if we want to heal and move on. Uh, that is very well put. I'm friends with Carrie Rawson, whose father is the infamous 
BTK serial killer, and uh, she can attest to the fact that it, um, I don't want to say has destroyed her, but she's um, in trauma therapy, and it's a constant battle because of what her dad did. Um, this is an interesting comment, because we always hear, uh, Megan, would you agree that the difference between Chad and Lori is Lori exhibited genuine signs of mental health issues and came to believe some things Chad never believed, that he isn't unwell? People always associate Lori with some sort of mental illness, but you never hear that about Chad. Wondering if you thought Chad was mentally ill too. Um, maybe it's a sexist thing. I don't know, but um, you see, he comes across like he's, I always say he's so dopey, but he's kind of like, seems like a normal dopey kind of guy, but maybe he too is mentally very, I mean, he's got to have issues, right? Yeah, this is a big question and I, I want to, um, I want to address it. Well, I also want to stay on track I want to say something about narcissism, but La Mesa Filipino Food Club is the person that put that comment up there. And I just want to say that La Mesa, you commented on an interview that I did with Lauren from Hidden True Crime recently, and you asked a really great question, but it was in the live chat and I couldn't see it, but I screenshotted it and I've been trying to figure out how to get in touch with you to answer the question. So email me or something um or well, find well, me Mesa, on... email me surviving the survivor at gmail and i'll get it over to uh megan surviving yeah. the survivor gmail.com yeah so um the question earlier was like do you think Lori's a narcissist i think she definitely exhibits um characteristics of narcissism and so does chad and that's why i mentioned that because um chad i think what was exciting for him is that he had been sort of this obscure author who wasn't very successful. And then he published Julie Rose book, which was about a near death experience. And he saw her becoming very successful because of that. And she was getting attention and speaking engagements and she was making money. And so Chad pivoted and started saying that his books were not fiction, that they were real uh, dreams that downloaded directly to his head because he'd had these near-death experiences. And um, if you listen to Heather Daybell talk about Chad's near-death experiences, um, she's not buying it. She says he never said they were near-death experiences until after he met Julie Rose. So there's there's an element of mental illness there, right? And also we can see, again, not getting your emotional needs met, but looking for external validation. And I think what was cool for him was that he had been super obscure. And then when Lori met him, she fell for everything he was saying, hook, line, and sinker. She loved his theology. And he was like, wow, cool. Somebody actually believes me. Um, so I think the two of them fed each other's narcissistic tendencies. And absolutely, Chad is mentally ill. It, it, you have to, there has to be mental illness when you get involved in killing people. It's at the very least, it's a delusion, which is probably one of the most dangerous mental illnesses because it's really hard to convince people that they're deluded. Uh, that is a great point. If you are deluded, it's tough to tell you that you're deluded because you're deluded and you don't know. So there you go. I saw someone in the chat saying, is Joel even paying attention? No, I'm just <laughs> hanging out golfing right now. I'm working on my golf. <laughs> I'm actually playing. What do you think I'm doing? I'm hosting this show. I'm taking notes. What's the matter with you guys? It's a big love, job, you guys. It's yeah. multitasking on steroids. Yes. I, I love <laughs> I love most. I love 99% of you, except that comment. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. I uh I also just got back from the gym, so I've got some energy left to, to nice. whine and complain. Uh Anna Maria wants to know where did you get this mental strength from? I honestly I don't think I have it. I think if you, if I went through what you went through, I would probably be laying in a gutter somewhere, um, unable to, uh, to cope. So where did this strength come from? I, through therapy, just came to the realization that I am an incredibly powerful being. And I think we all are. I think, I think we all have the capability to, to heal from our wounds, whatever they may be. Um, I don't like this idea of sort of the trauma Olympics, like what you went through was so much worse than what, you know, I went through. And so my trauma is not as bad as yours. Guys, it's all trauma. And it's not the event that is the difficult thing. It's the negative beliefs that we develop about ourselves because of the event. 
And when I went through therapy, learning to undo that programming and those negative beliefs that I wasn't worthy of good treatment, that I wasn't powerful, that I didn't have a voice in my own life, overcoming those beliefs is where I got the strength from. I think all of us have that strength and all of us know intuitively what we need in order to heal. But we sometimes dismiss it because we think, oh, that 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 can't be true or, oh, that's too weird or that's too hard or how who am I to know? I mean, you are an incredible amalgamation of phys physicality and spirituality. Every single one of us are. But we dismiss the goodness about ourselves because there is a real existential feel fear, sorry, a real existential fear of being successful and being powerful because it comes with some responsibility to live up to who you actually are. It's easier for us to keep ourselves small than it is to admit that we're really, really big and we have a lot of capacity and we have a lot of capability. And if we step into that role, it's kind of scary because then we think to ourselves, it means we always have to be that person and we're going to be perceived as that person. We always have to live up to that power. But I can tell you one of the things that um, helps me continue to be powerful is that I also admit that I'm weak and I'm flawed and I have bad days and I have, um, you know, I, I cry a lot. I go through difficulties a lot. You know, the last seven days, I've kind of been through some real hellish stuff and it's made me not want to work on my podcast and not want to put myself out there on social media and all that stuff. So we have to admit to ourselves that we're both powerful and weak. We have to love all the parts of ourselves. We have to admit to ourselves that we're both light and dark, that we have a good side and a bad side that we are capable of incredible compassion and also incredible cruelty. And we have to allow all of those parts of ourselves a place at the table. And it's our job to love all of the parts of ourselves and put them in their appropriate place and let them come out at the appropriate time and ask them to step back when it's not the appropriate time. Um. Is it me or is Megan like a modern day Socrates here? I feel like I'm listening to like a modern day philosopher because uh, she's saying all these things that I think about all the time. I, I, It's funny. The COE, she kind of just goes on with life. I love it. The COE, um, she just rolls with the punches. Me, I'm like asking myself a million questions. Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? Why am I not doing this? So it's interesting to hear someone who's got kind of a similar um, mindset and questioning a lot of things. Um, Question everything. Yeah, there you go. Question everything. Well, one of the things you said uh, really uh, struck me, and that's about the trauma Olympics. So everyone's going to be like, here he goes again. But I just wrote a book about my mother, and I hope you will read it, Megan, because I think that you will uh, gain some inspiration from it. But she's a Holocaust survivor. And uh, there was a point where – she'd run up against people who said, well, you weren't in, in a concentration camp. She was hidden in a Catholic school. She was very young. Um, and so there's a, this kind of not, my mom never got involved in it, but there is like this competition amongst, and I've, I've witnessed this firsthand between Holocaust survivors. Well, I was in Auschwitz, but I was, but you were only in a Russian labor camp, that sort of thing. But the lesson to take away from it is, you know, my mom went like you kind of to hell and back and she lost a child and uh she's not like me like she would not be in the gutter uh crawled up in a fetal position she's um a fighter all the way i know she if she was here right now she'd scream at me and say i'm not that way either but it is amazing <laughs> like what people can endure and uh come through on the other side so the book is obviously partly her holocaust story but it's also um inspirational and also goes to show you that you could come back from just about um anything i do want to ask you a little bit about um you know the this the sort of the the horrific stuff that you went through uh and i know that's probably not the best way to end the interview but we don't have to end it that way but first question before we get there is do you ever have any would you ever have any interest in seeing or speaking to Lori? since you're kind of this truth seeker would you ever want to go meet with her and say hey what really happened here you know, I do. I, I would love to speak with her. I actually went um, I, I went online and applied to be put on her visitors list. 
and I was approved initially and then rejected. So <laughs> I don't know if that was her rejecting it or if it was like she wasn't allowed to have visitors at all or whatever. So, you know, I, I would love to talk with her because I do I do want to just sit and listen. I want to listen to her story. I want to listen to um, the evolution of, of how we got to this place. And I would love to just um, understand better because I think understanding um, how we got here is is the most important thing about this whole tragedy. And if we can if we can get to that place of understanding, I think it helps prevent future suffering. Um, I don't think Lori would talk to me though. Um, you know, I don't know how much she actually has seen of as far as press and everything like that, but. I've been pretty clear, like you, I'm sick of Lori, you know, I'm sick of seeing her face on the TV. I'm sick of watching her flip her hair and smile when she walks into court. And I, and I was so angry after her closing arguments that, you know, I said, my wish is that the rest of her trials will, will be, you know, that the courthouses will be vacant and that there will be no microphones and no cameras and no way for her to, to continue to profit off of this sickness that, that she created. I think it's disgusting. Uh, Dom's mom, Megan, do you plan on following Chad's trial? I'll probably follow it. I probably won't listen to every word that gets testified to there. I do want to understand Chad's role better. I do want to understand what else law enforcement has to say about Alex's involvement. So I think that's important. But um, I'm less concerned uh, about listening to every word of Chad's trial because I think some of it is going to be um, you know, information that we already know from Lori's trial, but I, I am very invested in, in seeing him get some justice. Uh, by the way, we do have a new STS channel surviving, uh, uh, best trials. I don't know. It's called surviving survivor trials, but it is hashtag best trials in true crime. Uh, what do you make of that day? Um, obviously you had a really tough time just now, uh, Megan looking at JJ entirely, but what did you make of that day in court where Lori basically asked to be removed because they were going to show the autopsy photos? Um, was she really having a hard time with that? Do you think, or was that just another attempt at attention there? Um, I think it was a little of both. Uh, I think it's hard for any mother to see their children hurt, even if they're the cause of that hurt. Um, but I also saw it as incredibly cowardly and um, disgusting for her to ask to be removed. And I'm so grateful that the judge did not give her a pass and essentially told her, no, we have to sit through this. We're going to be traumatized by this. You have to sit through it, too. And, you know, that's that was the appropriate thing. I'm really glad he did that. Uh, everyone's been asking this in the chat from uh, Lindsay Hendricks to rep all those people. If Megan feels up to answering, what does she make of Lori's sentencing statement that almost immediately began quoting the gospel? I personally was sick to my stomach and wanted to flip a table. Yeah, I was very, very angry at that. It was difficult for me to control my uh, disgust and and rage at listening to her talk about her victims in that way and to justify it with scripture. I think it's disgusting. And it, it's it's the age old trope of people doing things in the name of God that are disgusting. People doing things, uh, harming people and murdering people and, and doing all kinds of terrible things in the name of God. And that that's one of the reasons why I want people to examine their relationship with religion really well, because part of the difficulty with the Mormon church is that it was founded by somebody who claims to have seen God and claims to speak to God. And the prophet of the Mormon church right now, today, claims to speak for God. And when you claim to speak for God, you can say almost anything and do almost anything and use that as a justification and I think that's incredibly harmful. I don't think anybody should be able to say that they that they speak for God or speak to God or knows what God wants. I don't think that you can know. And I'm very suspicious of anybody who says that. So, yeah, I, I really dislike um, Lori trying to use scripture and religion to justify these murders and to explain away her her greed and her sickness and. I think the judge nailed it when when he said she went down a religious rabbit hole and she's still there. 
Um, she's deluded herself into believing these things because I think believing the truth at this point would kill her. Hmm. Uh, I'm reading Dr. Von Decay's comment uh, about me, which is kind of very serious, but it's also making me laugh a little bit. I've told Joel this before, but his anxiety stems from his mom epigenetically and transgenerationally when Carm was little. One mistake could have meant her life, but she was successful. I'm reading this out loud for Carm. Uh, she survives. I keep telling Carm after writing this book, I never realized there's, no, there's a second half to this, that I do have uh, what they call generational trauma. Joel now carries the anxiety of making one mistake that Carm passed on in the womb, even though environmentally Carm had no fear because she was successful in the act of surviving his fear of jail to have a huge fear of prison. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I read it for two reasons. Number one, Carm C. People think I have generational trauma. Number two, my dad is a psychiatrist. Uh, he would he would laugh at this because he said none of this matters. It's how you act. It's not how you feel. It's how you act in life. And he would say that you got to move forward, do your podcast, do your thing. And uh, this is why I'm going to write my second book about my dad because he had a ton of wisdom like – uh, Megan has a ton of wisdom. Some people just have it. Others don't. Uh, Megan and my dad definitely have it. Uh, this is the book um, that Megan wrote here. Um, by the way, I'm still looking at my golf tutorial on the phone while I'm doing this. Again, the new STS channel is still up there. I walked through fire to get here. So, Megan, I know we kind of started with a, a screenshot of this. Um, this is your book. Um, aside from, forget Lori Vallow, but you were sex trafficked and uh how did this happen how did this begin how old were you uh, i just want you to be able to kind of express this so people can get the book and by the way people in the chat said hey this is one of the best interviews you know how you can help i'm gonna tweet out the link i'm gonna put it at podcast uh on twitter at podcast sts twitter at podcast sts and on instagram at surviving the survivor at surviving the survivor are you on insta megan i am under Megan Connor? Uh, that's my personal account, but my, um, you know, talking about health and healthy people and healing is at third underscore verse. And I'm there on TikTok and Instagram. And that's where my YouTube channel is as well. Do me a favor, text me that. So I'm, I will. I'm still on the uptake. But, um, anyway, I'm <laughs> going to okay. share all the links there. Megan will reshare and you guys reshare and that way people will see this interview it takes a village but um someone says Lori is brainwashed pure and simple but so everything else aside how did you end up being sex trafficked how old were you and how did you get out of all that yeah so i was seven years old um i was just texting that to you sorry that's okay and um there was a babysitter that lived one street over from us and it was the couple of them that had a a basement photo studio basically and myself and some other children in the neighborhood were photographed they took pictures and videos of us and sold them and i got out of it because we moved away so i was really fortunate that i didn't have to um as a as an 11 year old child try to try and escape from that system because that would have been really difficult for 11 year old me to do. Um, but the programming that I received in that basement stayed with me um, long into my adulthood and made things really difficult for me. And what was more traumatic about that was having the family that I did where there was a lot of emotional neglect and where I was not believed and where I was silenced and shamed and and it was just a really hard family situation as well and so the combination of those two things um just made it got me into this place of repeating the same unhealthy relational patterns all the time so i was super grateful to have been able to exit and when i was going through therapy i started doing a lot of journaling and that's where this book comes from so it did not um, it does not mention lori at all um, except for one little hint towards Lori and the, that part of the family, but I didn't intend that when I wrote it. The difficult thing is, um, you know, this was uh, this book came out of my journaling and my therapy journey, and I wrote it because I wanted other people who'd been through 
similar traumatic experiences to know that it was possible to heal and possible to have a happy life. Because when I was in my group therapy sessions, I didn't see examples of any women who were really getting it out, getting out. I, I felt like I saw examples of a lot of people who were perpetually in therapy and who are always going to be um, in an unhealthy place. And so that was the purpose. What's difficult about it is that I had to get to the point where I stop revising and editing and just let it go because a lot of what I wrote in there is not how I feel now. And I'm recording the audiobook right now and it's super painful for me because I just want to revise all of it because it's it's so different from how I feel now. So I guess that just means there needs to be another book. Just be glad you didn't record it with your 85 year old mother, which I just did. And it always put me in the grave, that experience. I, lo I love her, but uh, Carm has a tendency to curse. Uh, she doesn't on the podcast, but she does. And the book is all conversation. So being the journalist that I am, I am a truth seeker like Megan. I put in the, uh, the cuss words. And then when we were doing the rec audio recording, every five seconds, Carm's like, I'm not reading that word. I'm not reading that word. So she'd stop and try to, I'm like, you got to read the words because she tried to think of another word. So she ended up using the word feces and effing and all. it was a, it was a, it took a couple of years off my life, but the book is I walk through fire to get here Buy it. It's on Amazon. It's anywhere books are sold. The audio books obviously coming out. Uh, Meg P wants to know if you talk to Colby, that's an interesting question. No, I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, Colby was really, really close with my oldest daughter. They spent a lot of time together as children. And um, I think of all of the living survivors of this tragedy, Colby probably has lost the most because his mom literally abandoned him and, you know, and then killed his siblings. And uh, Lori also killed you know, Charles, who was arguably the best father figure that Colby had. And so I have so much hurt and compassion for Colby. I think he sort of has distanced himself from the family for the most part, which I think is really healthy and great. I think it's probably the best thing for his family and his relationship. But if he's out there and Colby, if you're ever listening to this or if you ever get word from somebody else, um, I would love to re-engage with Colby and and to, um, you know, just be a supportive person in his life and help him get whatever he needs and and to help him heal. Colby, if you're listening, uh, reach out, reach out. Um, Megan wants to talk to you. Uh, people want to know what the story is behind the cover. It's a very cool cover. Uh, the artwork. Did, did you happen to make that art? I did make that art. Um, that was from a from an art therapy session that I was in during my intensive outpatient work. And every day at the end of our sessions, we had a meditation done for us um, where we got to sort of rebuild our spirit after having been broken down. And it was a meditation that took us through all of the chakra energies. And I don't know if I'm saying if it's chakra or chakra, I don't know which is the pr proper pronunciation. Someone can tell me. Um, but it was, um, you know, all, all of the colors and the body systems of the, of the chakra. And so this cover is a self-portrait. This is how I viewed myself if I was just thinking about the colors of my spirit at that time. And if you can see, um, there is a little small blue dot um, up there near the top. And that is the chakra that is the voice. And at the time, I felt like my voice was so tiny and like I was never going to be able to um, talk openly about my experiences. And so it's amazing for me to look at this now. And I wonder what my self-portrait would look like now because it is not that. Um, I think this is beautiful. I love it as, a, as an expression of, of who I was. But when I envision myself moving through the world, this is I envision um, the light and the energy of the chakra coming out of me as I, as I walk through the world. And, um, that's how I see myself. Mm. Um, so many positive comments, Anna Maria, you're so creative. Megan, uh, Me Megan is multi-talented. Uh, the cover speaks oceans of feelings. Yes, it does. Ned Smith here with a super chat. Thank you, Megan. All the best to you and your family. Blackwood door. 
Am I allowed to tell people Black Widow? She sent me a beautiful piece of artwork, and she is very talented in the Republic of Ireland, of all places, mm. uh, where it is cold and chilly. But she sent me a beautiful uh, piece of artwork. So uh, Anna Marie says, now you're doing it, Megan. Um, really, an un I was not expecting this. An unbelievable uh, story here. Megan Connor is the mother of six spectacular human beings, a breaker of generational trauma cycles. You just heard it all here. She survived sex trafficking as a child. She spent almost 40 years in other abusive systems before learning how to break free. Now she is like a bird on a wire. She is free. Her book is I Walk Through Fire to Get Here and 100 Ways to Practice Self-Care. What is the number one way to practice self-care? What is, in your opinion, the best way to practice self-care? If you can get really quiet with yourself and just sit in your emotions and allow yourself to feel them and to honor them. I think when our emotions come up for us, the best thing that we can do is say, thank you, have gratitude for that emotion because it teaches you what's important to you. And I think we don't get quiet enough. And I think when we do get quiet and allow ourselves to feel every feeling, we are inspired to know what we need and what is going to be the best self-care for us. Um, I'm wearing these bracelets that my daughter's made for me. And yesterday, uh, Z-Bugs, the middle one, says, oh, I didn't know you were a Swifty. And I was like, what are you talking about? It says reputation on here. The other one says STS. And she's like, oh, you're a Swifty because you're into reputation. I guess my other daughter gave me that. But my point is, all these people worshiping the Taylor Swifts of the world, the Beyonce's. But right here, you've got Megan Connor with tons of wisdom. Uh, Megan, it was absolutely amazing uh, to have you on the show. Megan, you're a brilliant and beautiful woman. Um, I would love to um, lend our limited, very limited expertise in podcasting, but the COE uh, knows more about that. I would sit quietly with myself, but the only problem is the COE is addicted to Instagram and she's on it all night and we lay in the same bed and um, it's hard to be quiet. Plus I have a puppy now in addition to Ethel, my boxer and um, everyone, if the COE, this is a final thing. I kind of go off track sometimes, but if the COE is laying in bed, Fred, Frederick Morris Roosevelt Brown won't bug her. He just goes and lays in his little spot next to the bed. But the minute I'm in bed, Fred Brown is clawing, he wants to be with me. I can't say that I'm his favorite, but he always wants to be with me. So I got to let him up in bed. So now I got Fred Brown and the COE and Ethel, and it's nearly impossible to sit in silence. But I'll try to do that, Megan, um, outside. Maybe It sounds uh, like you need some boundaries with your dog so that you can have some <laughs> peace. <laughs> and my children, if you're listening, kids, I love, I, I love you. Um, all right. Um, it was really amazing to have you. So where, where, what state are you physically in right now? I'm in Texas. In Texas. So love you, America. Love you, Texas. And um, man, it is uh, the real tragedy here, of course, is JJ and Tylee. Our thoughts are with them and uh, with the Vallow and Connor family and uh, wishing everyone uh, in their family uh, the very best. Ned Smith says, uh, we already read this, COE. Thank you, Megan. All the best to you and your family. But uh, let's connect outside of here. And it was an absolute pleasure. Stick around for one second, Megan. Uh, love you guys. See you tomorrow, 5 p.m. on Madeline Soto.